Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary. And I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Welcome one, welcome all. This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got Endgame. We're talking about dungeons, we're talking about raids, we're talking about what happens when you reach level 80. Stay tuned. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to the second exciting edition of Tales of Tyria live video recording session. So again, this is sort of a new thing, if you'd bear with us while we work the kinks out. So far this week, I think we've got a significantly better setup than we did last week. We'll have to ask for your feedback, and uh, let me uh, introduce the show. Welcome one, welcome all. We are almost live well, that is to say, we are live from the Rosewind Tavern in the great city of Lion's Arch. And we got a great show for you today. Uh, won't you tell a friend about it? Or if you feel like it, go ahead and give us a review on iTunes. But uh, we'd appreciate it if you spread the word, if you enjoy the show. That's how you can give back to us. Uh, well, let me introduce myself. I am Bridger, a.k.a. Adam Ruzo here with the Sound Strategy Network, www.sound-strategy.net. I am your host for this evening, and joining me, we have, as you can see around me, four great co-hosts. Let's start with Mr. Vega. Hello, Jay. How's it going? Pretty good. How's everyone else doing? Doing good over here. Joining us as well, we have Great back again. Welcome. Sup? <laughs> <laughs> being ghetto up all the way from Yukon. Look out, he's in the hood. Also today, we have uh, Spoof Proof joining us for the first time. Welcome, sir. What's going on, everybody? And for the first time joining us as well, Kai, who uh, is... Hello. Yes, hello! Joining us all the way from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for staying up our, so late on our behalf. No problem. Uh, so I will give you a plug because I know you have a web presence at uh, kaidream.wordpress.com, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Also on uh, YouTube as Kai Dream, doing a uh, Guild Wars 2 related YouTube channel. So if you guys uh, want to check that out, I'd recommend it. Um, I don't know about, uh, do any of you guys have a plug that you want to make, Jay or, or Great or Spoof? Do you have a web presence? No, sir. Um, nope. Just got the, uh, I mean, we have the Twitter page for Tales of Tyria. Yeah, well, there you go. Tales of Tyria.com. So we have us, us slubs over here that are like, come check out the channel that you're already watching on right now. And, we're, oh, and, and we have a special guest <laughs> with her own website who's remote and mysterious with an accent and everything. All right. Let's get on with the show, guys. Uh, first, I want to take a quick moment to, uh, to you know, get everybody to, to know all of us on here, because uh, one of the best things about podcasts is you listen to them week after week, and you can sort of build a relationship with the hosts, even though you never talk to them. Um, they talk to you an awful lot, and that's what I do best, honestly. So we're going to go through a little segment they call, What Are You Doing? When we actually, the game comes out, the, the, the segment will be, What Are You Doing? Interior. So uh, to start with, I'll let you know what I've been doing the last week, is I've been playing the hell out of a game called Stellar Impact. And uh, that is... Essentially, Dota in space, or how we like to call Space Dota. It's a Defense of the Ancient style game, or League of Legends, if you've played that. And uh, the real, the real kick of it is, is it's a small indie developer. It's like it's like nine or ten people, maybe max, developing it. But they did a really good job of making the ships feel really well. If you ever played Navy Field, did you guys ever play that game? It's like an MMO with you're playing as a battleship or whatever. It feels very much like that, and the ship movement and everything feels very smooth and interesting and fun to do, but at the same time, not as unforgiving as Dota, so that's why I like it. So, uh, Vega, what have you been doing this week? 
This week, I was in BlizzCon mode. Ah. And I took off of work Thursday and Friday and drove six hours to Connecticut to hang out with my buddy and <laughs> have I a little... I thought you were going to say, so I drove to BlizzCon. Nope, it's not nearly <laughs> as awesome as that. Yeah, but we had a little LAN party. We set up our computers watching BlizzCon and... Uh, that was pretty much it. Um, I mean, I, I'm I, I'm sure most people knew it was BlizzCon, but uh, I wasn't overwhelmed with what they announced. But I mean, it's still fun. Come on, pandas! Who doesn't love <laughs> I pandas? Mean, I'm not. Uh, to me, the biggest news was that you know, if you sign up for the year of WoW, you get Diablo three for free. That was that was the biggest news to me. But other than that, I like pandas and I like Kung Fu Panda. But I don't want to be. Every, everybody's a panda saying Jack Black <laughs> should play as uh, the voice actor for <laughs> the, the the monk panda. <laughs> if they had, if they had the turtle from Kung Fu Panda, what the hell was his name? Uguay. Uguay. If they had Uguay, then it would have been great. But other than that, but I, also I was playing D3 Beta because uh, one of one of my ah. friends' friends came and installed it on his computer, and we were playing that for a while. So I heard it's like 15 minutes long. It's it's I mean it's short. It's like the first uh like major quest chain. Maybe it takes like two hours if you're kinda like taking your time, but it's still fun. Stay a while and listen. Alright, moving on to great. What have you been doing this week? Me? Not much. I mean school's kinda in full gear right now, but I have been finding the time to like play some stuff. I'm getting back into Oblivion. <laughs> Just cause Skyrim is literally like two to three weeks now or something yeah. away, so I'm going to be playing that, and I'll probably be playing that up until the release of Guild Wars 2, at least. Alright, so, Spoof, what have you been doing this week? Uh, I've actually been playing Total Miner, which just got put out on Xbox Live, which is basically a Minecraft clone, uh -huh. and what's completely ridiculous is that I could spend four hours a day playing a game in which you do absolutely nothing. <laughs> you make <laughs> There's no, no, no progress. No, no enemies to beat, nothing to do except chop wood and build houses, and that's it. And I'll play it forever. It's impressive. I just <laughs> always like whenever you 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 can't. People will tell you you're bullshitting them when you go up and say, "So you, you see this block game that I'm playing? Yeah, the one with the crappy <laughs> graphics where you don't do anything except hit trees. <laughs> punch, yeah, punch, punch, that punch. sold like more than half a million copies and made so the single guy who made it insanely rich." They'd say, no, no, you're punking me right now, aren't you? It's crazy how much that game has just taken off. All right, so uh, lastly, Kai, what you been doing this week? Um, well, I've actually been trying to find a game that I want to play that isn't Guild Wars 2. I'm struggling, so I'm not playing anything. Um, just making YouTube videos and studying at university. Yeah, I've, That's been, it. I've been there. I've been in the funk where I can't find anything. <laughs> Just like, I, I can't wanna... find anything at all. Like, I want to play an MMO, but there's nothing that's worthwhile at the moment, so a bit bored. Play well, Guild Wars. I mean, I want to try and get into Guild Wars, the original one. I kind of for... have been feeling a hankering to play that again, too. I, I own the original. I don't own any of the expansions, but I would actually kind of want to go back and play the original again to get the backstory that I that I completely forgotten about. The, the only thing I remember is the very interesting part, how you... Uh, start in that little thing, and then the what do they call it? The burning, the the, the searing, the searing happens, yeah. and it changes everything. And that was amazing to me. I was like blown away. But it only happens at one time, really. So I mean, they might have done it more. But anyway, let's get back to talking about Guild Wars number two. So um, let's start off with a little segment we like to call um, everything we know or what we know about. In this case, the end game. What, what do we know about the end game of Guild Wars 2? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I've prepared a statement, everything we know about end game. There are four five-man dungeons. This concludes the segment about everything that we know about Guild Wars 2 <laughs> end game. Seriously, they have been dodging that question every time it is oh, posed. Pretty much everywhere. Um, More than I knew. So, yeah, there's basically eight total dungeons in the game. Four of them are going to be at level 80. They st you start going to the first one at level 30, I think. And so it's probably like 30, 40, 50, 60. No, that doesn't, the, the math doesn't add. Maybe it's every 15 levels. I don't know. But uh, 
let's 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 back up a second because these dungeons are not just like a single instance of Shadow Fang Keep. Let's say um, they have some very interesting concepts on it. And if you want to get the full scoop, there's actually on the Guild Wars Two page itself. There's a whole article about the dungeons. But to give you the brief recap, there's a story mode where as you go through each dungeon, you sort of go through them with one of or more one one or more of the the heroes of the story of Guild Wars Two. This group of, of heroes known as Destiny's Edge, or what used to be Destiny's Edge. Um, now it's now it's like the Edge of Destiny or something. So as you go through, each dungeon has a storyline that progresses the relationship between all these characters, and it's kind of a, an interesting sounding situation. So if you want to learn more about the actual mechanics of the, of the story and the lore behind the dungeons, that's a really cool read. Um, but mechanically, you have a storyline mode, and then you have three, at least three explorable modes in each dungeon. So we know that at level 80, you'll have four dungeons times, like, three. So you'll probably have about 12 different environments with which to do some really hardcore PvE experience. But, now we get to the question, because people say, Well, what do I do after I've done each of those? Anybody? Uh, well, I know that they have uh, all the different wings that they're going to open up, which is, is pretty sweet. You get to go in uh, and do the different wings. They won't add much to the story, really, but uh, it's going to go from being the story mode, which is kind of an easy play kind of thing. You could pick up a group and go into these explore wings, which you're going to really need to, uh, to find some people who know what they're doing. It's going to make it a lot more challenging for you. So it's a way to kind of go back and play it again, but play it a little bit more seriously and uh, take some real time and some real strategy getting through it, which is pretty nice. So, well, they also said that um, the dungeons will also have uh, dynamic events mm -hmm. either yeah. associated to them or inside of them. So now not only do you have, you know, two or three different variations in the dungeon, but you also have these possible dynamic events that can happen. So... There may, there may only be eight dungeons at the start, but at least, you know, really you have upper 20s, 30s of different sorts of wings and variations, so you're not getting bored, at least. And they also well, have mentioned that every dungeon is going to have its own armor unique to that yeah. dungeon, its own sets of armor, and you won't find that in any other dungeon, so if you're a completist... You might want to go through each dungeon and try to get each type of armor. See, today I'm feeling like the dragon skin armor, I think, yes, you know? Well, what's yeah. interesting is, like, they keep saying, oh, you know, dungeons and all these cool things that I do with dungeons, but they really haven't, like, showed us a dungeon. Like, mm -hmm. they haven't sat down and said, like, here's what you can do in a dungeon, here's how it's going to be. We've had, like, that one video where it shows, like, some highlights from a dungeon. I think it was the, the intro. Thing. It was, like, the cinematic it was the intro of yeah. a dungeon. And then it had a couple, like, shots of a group, like, doing, like, a boss and some encounters or something. But they didn't really, like, show what they're going to try to do inside of them, like, uh, difficulty-wise and encounter-wise. That's true. I like the fact they said it was controlled by players, so the, the dynamic events inside the dungeon were triggered by the players' actions. So it sounds like, you know, sometimes you could go in there and it wouldn't happen. And then sometimes, depending on what action you choose to take, you could set off a dynamic event, which is really cool. Yeah, the other thing that, um, that you have to keep in mind, though, the fact that we haven't seen any dungeons probably just means that ArenaNet's not ready to show them. Because if you look at everything that ArenaNet has shown, it's all ridiculously good-looking. They don't show off animations or anything that's, like, placeholder. Like, I was amazed when you look at the videos that they've released and you know if you look at the class pages on the website all of those animations look phenomenal they're clearly done and when you look at all of the work that they've shown off at the conventions it's clearly sort of completed work for the most part i mean obviously they're going to be doing tweaking but there's not missing content there there's not missing placeholder art or voices or sound effects they only want to show you what the game is actually going to look like so if they're not showing you dungeons it probably means that they're just not done with them and they're not proud of that work yet they're still working on it so i'm expecting that we're going to see it sometime you know obviously before the game comes out but we'll probably see more of it later so this brings up an interesting question my question to you guys is, people are asking, well, if there's only four dungeons, what do I do at level 80? 
My question in response to that is, why do you need anything to do at level 80? Why does the game have to keep going? I... Well, I think... (laughs) I have an opinion that the whole end game has just been brainwashed into people in that... In most MMOs, you you rush to end game. You want to get there because that's where the good raids are. That's where the you know you you're gonna start grinding to get gear and move up and do higher and higher raids. Um, and I I think every game needs an end game. So to, to I I think you do need to have the question or I you know I need to have something to do once I hit 80 because. You know, once I get there, there has to be something to do. But in Guild Wars, there is stuff to do. You have more dynamic events, and there are the dungeons. And they were saying that the dungeons, um, especially when you're going out of the story mode and you're doing the harder wings, at level 80, you may only have five people, but you're going to need a lot of teamwork and a lot more coordination to beat these dungeons. So it's not just like, I think where people are getting thrown off is when you say dungeons, most people just think, wow, and that the dungeons aren't really that challenging, and mm-hmm. you don't need a lot of teamwork to get through them. In Guild Wars, those you know end game dungeons, you're gonna need to have like perfection in your coordination and teamwork in order to get through them. And I, I think, think that's be that's where like you know. Rates. Yeah, pretty much. It's gonna you know, that's where your time is gonna go into. It's not gonna be, I, okay, now I have to go do this to grind the gear in order to do this dungeon. It's gonna be I need to play more to learn how to beat this dungeon. Or, or just talk to your teammates and say, okay, clearly it didn't work when you tried using your warrior as uh, an AoE. Maybe we should tweak it, and I'll use AoE on my elementalist, and you can just try and go in for single damage combat or something like that because of all the different combinations of classes. Because remember, theoretically, you're not going to need a certain t- class or a certain type of class. You're not going to need a guardian slash warrior in every group because of the death of the Holy Trinity, supposedly. We'll see if that holds true in these very difficult situations where you may want the classes that excel at certain roles to be in those roles. But we'll have to, again, we'll have to see. But it's certainly possible, due to the concept of all the flexibility that each of the classes has, it may be more of a puzzle of not figuring out which classes to use to beat a specific part of a dungeon, but how to best utilize the classes that your group currently has. You know, in WoW it was, okay, we need to figure out how many warriors we need and what their job is. In this one, okay, we have a, a group where two elementalists, a necromancer, and a ranger, and a thief. How are we going to make that happen? And then another group with completely different makeup is maybe like going to find a completely different way to beat that dungeon. We don't know. I'm hoping that's the case, because that would be really interesting. Well, and I think everyone's got to be on their toes as well. So you could have someone who's primarily taking a sort of defensive stance, depending on what profession they play. They could die. Someone else has got to pick up that role and go into a defensive stance, as well as, you know, keeping an eye on their own health. So I think you've got not only got to have teamwork, but you've also got to keep an eye on yourself and know what you're doing and be ready to pick up any role that the group needs at any time. So this leads to a very interesting discussion. Um, my question about why do we need to have anything to do at level 80? Um, obviously the answer to that for me and for a lot of other people is once you've finished going through the PVE stuff, because I know I'm really excited about exploring the world and the lore and figuring out what cool dynamic events there are. And I like the idea of the personal story. And I think, you know, they already mentioned it kind of culminates, um, one of the last dungeons that you go through is, is I think fighting one of the elder dragons. Uh, they haven't mentioned much about it, but they kind of mentioned, hinted at that's where it's going. So once you've done all of that PvE stuff, for me, the answer is going to be all of the replayability in the game while I'm waiting for an expansion with more PvE content is going to be PvP. But some people obviously aren't satisfied with that answer. Well, I mean, the whole thing is, the the reason why they haven't, I guess, told us that much, like every time they get asked a question like, what about the end game?" And they always do that like sort of sidetrack question where it's like, you won't want to get to the end game really fast. Well, no, what they say is the end game starts at level 10, and then it goes all the way up to 80. That's what they say. That's their little... That, that's their answer. They're trying to say, like, as you level up, that's your whole experience. Why should you wait to the end to get the good stuff? And I know, yeah. you know there is going to be people who are going to blow through thinking that 
there's all this content waiting for them at level 80. And when they get there, they're going to be like, this game sucks, even though they just skipped all of the content. <laughs> but the good news for them is they can sidekick themselves down and, and actually enjoy that content. So well, yeah. I think that... Good. I think that even if you rush through the, the 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 middle and beginning of the game, you know it's not, you know, like in WoW and all that stuff. Like, yeah, you just do your you do your quest, you do your quest, you do your dungeons. All you do want to do is just level up as fast as you can. I feel like in Guild Wars 2, even if you do that, you're still going to experience all the dynamic events and the dungeons and the quests because no matter what you're doing, you're either progressing your personal story or doing a dynamic event you know like the i feel like there isn't a way to really rush through the game without even experiencing it even if you're trying to just get through it as quickly as possible i'm just letting the the chat room know that i am watching what they're saying in there as well so if they have any comments about our conversation they can feel free to chip in and let us know um, shout to us <laughs> shout at us yes and by the way if you're listening to the audio version of this and you want to watch next week every week we're going to try and do it at eight o'clock eastern time uh which is minus five gmt but because of daylight savings time it's currently minus four utc um if you just do a search for what time is it in new york city new york then you'll know exactly what it, what, what what time we're talking about it's 8 p.m so uh that's when we're going to try and do it every sunday night okay back to the concept here because my question originally was, why does there have to be stuff at 80? And the idea is, like what somebody said earlier, is you get brainwashed into thinking that MMO content has to be infinite. If I don't have something new to do all the time, the game has failed me. And yeah. there's no other genre where you take that stance. You don't go, well, I beat Dragon Age 2, and now there's nothing left to do. That game sucks. You know? Well, there's also the I, I, fact that that there's okay. a this whole like end game mentality really came into effect when games were subscription, so you had to constantly be doing something to like justify your your keeping to play this game and paying for it. So without subscription for Guild Wars 2, it's not like you need to constantly have to be doing something. You can stop playing for a month or two and then like come back and do the new hard dungeons that may be out by then. That's true. Yeah. To, to to me, I just I. I get like irked by the statement, why do I need anything to do at 80? Because I feel like the game, as you progress and get higher and higher levels, there should be more epic dynamic events and more like difficult dungeons and <coughs> things should progress in that sense. You know, like, yeah, you, you may not need to have what WoW has and that you have to be raiding three days a week in order to get the best gear to move on and on and on. I don't like that, but I do like when I get to 80, there's much more epicness going on. I personally feel that, you know, while you're leveling throughout the game from 1 to 80, you're, you know, building up your character, you're learning how to play it, you're getting the gear that you need, and, you know, getting all the skills that you want. And then if you get to end game and there's nothing to do, all that kind of building up your character and getting the gear is kind of wasted. Like, you feel like you're building up, like you said, to something epic. And if there's nothing epic at the end of it, you kind of feel like, oh, what have I just spent these 80 levels doing? You might as well have just started off with a level 80 character and ran around and do some dynamic events. Okay, so now let's take it in a new direction. Because this, this is my new uh, answer. And I'm going to maybe make some people unhappy with this concept. So let's, <laughs> let's first discuss what um, what raiding is in the WoW context, because that's technically what you do at the end of WoW, and that's what people expect in MMOs these days, is what WoW does, obviously. It's the gold standard. So in case you have not played WoW or you never got to that point, let me explain what raiding is. Raiding is a larger version of the instanced dungeons where you have 10 to 40 people in order to beat a certain type of content. That means a lot of organization, that means a lot of people on voice chat, and that means uh, often bosses that have very specific mechanics that you have to learn through trial and error. So if you're going up against a particular boss that maybe uh, uses, breathes fire in a particular area every 30 seconds or whatever, and the only way to beat that boss is to have people that can interrupt his fire attack to save the group, then you have to have certain classes that have the interrupt and they have to 
alternate on cooldowns in order to block that attack. Otherwise, if one of them misses it, the whole group wipes, right? These are very complicated, very intricate logistical challenges. And it's usually involving a large group. Now, they're very difficult to do. And once you've done one of them, the lowest tier one that, that you can do, you have to do it over and over again until everybody in the group acquires a certain set of gear. We'll call it a tier. A tier one is what they called it. And wow, it was a development term that actually got taken over to the, the main group. So you've got tier one gear. That's the gear that drops in the first raid. Now you have enough power to enter the next raid. If you decide, I don't like this first one, I want to go and explore the next one, you can't do it because it's unbeatable or virtually unbeatable unless you have the tier one gear. So you are forced to basically grind this thing even if you don't want to in order to access the new content. It's a barrier to content. Um, and that sort of happens every time. Once you beat tier one and you can go into the next raid, you must grind that until your entire group of 30 or 40 people, sometimes 25, has the gear that can then go on to the next raid. So, let me now talk about this very profound statement that I found. It's a single post on the second page of a 65-page thread on the Guild Wars 2 Guru forums, and some of you probably know which one I'm talking about. 65 pages and 1,400 posts later, they still haven't even responded to this post, which answered everything. And the, the question about this post was, will dynamic events replace raids? And the initial poster was very insightful. He's like, dynamic events are just, you know, are just like raids. Raids just happen in a cave. He was very detrimental towards raiders and things like that. And that's one of the reasons the post got ridiculously long. But here's the post on the second page. Raids don't exist in a vacuum. Oh, sorry, quote. Raids don't exist in a vacuum. They are part of a whole, I like to call, classic MMOs. Those classic MMOs have some very specific rules. One, players need to play for as long as possible, since the model was created based on pay to play per month. Two, in order to get enough content to keep people around for as long as possible, the easiest path is to make players grind for as long as possible. Three, players love to grind under the idea that their character will become stronger by doing so, even if this increase in power is illusory. Doing 10 damage to a 100 HP monster is seen as significantly worse than doing 1,000 damage to a 10,000 HP monster. This feature is called progression, and it's a, just a trick to keep players playing for a longer time. People have been indoctrinated into believing that all MMOs should have it. 4. Level grind is a great way to add progression, but sooner or later, later players will reach the level cap. There needs to be some other way to grind. 5. Gear grind complements level grind. It can be stretched for as long as possible, uh, so a given character will only have reached the level cap and then reached the gear cap by a time an expansion is, is released, effectively increasing both the level cap and the gear cap. Five, uh, six, in order to stretch the time it takes to reach the gear cap, it requires a few tricks. Drop rates must be very low, so people have to do the same area over and over again. It must require challenging content, so success rate must be low. And it must require a lot of people, since organizing peop a lot of people is a lot harder and happens less frequently than organizing a few players. These features have been packed together and called raids. While those raids are just one more trick to keep players around for a longer time, in classic example of carrot dangling on a stick method, MMO players have been deceived into believing that they are actually a required part of any MMO. Guild Wars 2 breaks all of those assumptions, so it does not have nor need to have raids. It is therefore logical that raiders won't accept dungeons or the event system as a replacement for raids. What they are missing is not only the raid themselves, but the entire illusion that surrounds raids. That is a very controversial, oh sorry, end quote. That is a very controversial statement. So, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> that was, I, I, I kind of got sidetracked. Um, I, think he, uh, I think he definitely makes a lot of good points. Um, but I mean, I feel, I feel with the history of, of Guild Wars 1, with the history of ArenaNet, they've, they've, they've been trying always pretty hard to, to bring new things to the table. And uh, what he mentioned about gear rewards and having low drop rates and having to work very hard for them, I wouldn't be surprised at all if 
Guild Wars 2 completely tried tried revamping Endgame in the sense that maybe instead of instead of big raids and uh, big gear rewards for you towards the end, what if it was almost like a world reward? What if, like in Guild Wars 1, where once you reached your max level, you opened up Underworld, where you could go into there, and it was only for the high levels. What if there's a new section of the continent there where instead of raids, it's just a community entering this area and executing dynamic events to preserve the environment of that afterworld, that that end game area. So you log on and your rewards, I mean you can get gear rewards, but for the most part your reward is going to be preserving this ongoing fight, this never ending kind of thing to keep the story going. Where grinding would serve a purpose. You're not just killing mobs to gain experience, you're not killing mobs to to get gear or resources. You're killing them to preserve this world to keep everything going. I wouldn't be surprised to see Guild Wars 2 doing something like that. I mean, I, I feel like they're trying to be very innovative with everything in this game, and I think that could be a great direction to head into. Actually, a lot of people had the same kind of suggestion in that thread where they would say, you know, I would be happy with very difficult dynamic events that are in an area exclusively for the, you know, fully leveled players, essentially. Uh, that you know, where, the, where these are things that guilds can go and tackle and actually have a real challenge, even if in multiple guilds working together to take down an Elder Dragon, for example, or something like that. Um, I should give credit where credit is due, by the way. The uh, author of that post it goes by the name Testy. <laughs> <laughs> it might be Testa, yeah. because it's T-E-S-T-E. -E. So I, I don't know for sure, but uh, but that's that's what uh, his name is written as. Um, I. Go ahead. I, I I think for the end game, um, that people just I don't think that they're aware of how big some of these dynamic events are going to be, because everything we've seen up until now, the two dragons that we saw, those weren't elder dragons. Those were little dragons. Those were those Great were guys. very very little dragons, and those were still you know those dynamic events had so many different elements going on in them for just that little tiny dragon. These Elder Dragons, which I, I can only assume that eventually we're going to see one and might have to fight one, that dynamic event could be so massive that you do need to, you know, get a group together to go handle this thing. Because as they said, you know, dynamic events scale with however many people are there, and the more people you have, the more challenging it'll be. But you still need a sort of, like, minimum number. You can't, two people can't go and kill a dragon. You know, you need to have people involved in this. So where you know, have WoW players saying that, you know, I miss having those big 25-man, 40-man raids and everything involved in that, you could very easily just transfer that over to these dynamic events. You know, you still have a guild with hundreds <laughs> of people and you could still have a raiding team going in there to handle these dynamic events, which I'm sure the endgame ones are going to be immense. And that is where I think people who want the rating will be satisfied. I think as well, just drawing on the point of um, what Spoof Crew said about, you know, working together as a world and, you know, we could get rewarded as a server rather than individually. I think that's definitely something Guild Wars have been looking at because, for example, things like World v. World, uh, PvP, where you've got Guild can control castles, um, for example, when dynamic events affect the world, I think they really want to focus on a community rather than you as a singular player, singular um, player. So I think definitely, I think things will affect the world and I hope that they do kind of implement that. And yeah, for example, with the PvP as well, with the guild castles, I think it will work together. All right. So an interesting, an interesting situation with regards to the end game because they have dodged that question a lot. And the line that they that they give is that, like I said before, is that end game starts at level 10, which is their way of saying what you do at level 80 is going to be the same thing that you do for the rest of the game. We're not going to hold back all of the cool mechanics until you get to level 80. Like, that's how rating was in WoW. You didn't get to go do the cool epic things until you got to level 80. That's why they were so happy to tell you that, you know, the to coddle was one of our little dragons, and you do it when you're in your level 40s, right? You're, you're less than halfway through the game, basically, and you're taking on this epic thing, 
where you can't really say the same when you're when you're at level 35 or 40 and wow your best thing was like yeah i get to ride a horse now most epic so that's uh it's a lot of really interesting stuff um let me ask the next question because i think the main thing that raiders are probably going to miss is the larger group coordination because what they point out is these epic dynamic events like the dragons are basically going to have to be tuned so that casual pugs pickup groups of people coming together not on voice chat not coordinated can still do them without that uh they would be way too difficult to do as a dynamic event. What guilds want is a larger event that they can do as an organized guild. And I could see that, like a 10-man ten, ten dungeon that would require more intricate things going on than a 5-man dungeon, for example. But, I don't know, what do you guys think about larger instanced type content for guilds? Well, um, I mean... I don't know how to put this, but the it's like raiding in other games is sort of about this very mechanical process, like uh, old Testy described to us. And it, I don't think it's going to be this. It's not going to be the same way. And like they're worried about dynamic events not being as uh, good as raiding. So I don't know. It's just it's weird because dynamic events they offer a whole different field compared to raiding. So I don't know about those people who do the raiding in games right now. Like, and wow. Because they go in there, and they go in there, and they keep doing the same thing. The strats are all, like, pretty much predetermined. And, I, I don't know. I just can't put this one... I, I think specific what, way. what I wouldn't be surprised they, they do is because of the fact that there is no Holy Trinity. That means that there is, you know, there there will be ways that you need to defeat the dragon, let's say. You know, like, they sort of mark the areas on him that you need to attack. And they give you many means of doing that. They have the sort of, like, cannons set up, the trebuchets. They have all these different ways of you attacking those points. The whole reason why I feel like there won't be, you know, we are fighting this dragon. This is what has to happen. This is what you're always going to do. Because there is no Holy Trinity, you can kind of, you know go with the flow as it happens. But I wouldn't be surprised, or maybe it, it would be good if the, the guilds that want to have more challenging dynamic events, if you can sort of like join an instance where you get 20 guys together and now you're going to fight this dragon and you're the only 20 guys in there. And so you don't have to deal with people who don't know what they're doing and, and so forth. Because let's say you're a guild that has 20 people and you run into a dynamic event but there's already a hundred people there. Now it's going to be that much more difficult, and there's going to be all those extra people there. So you know, it kind of, if it's a nice kind of feeling of chaos, but at the same time, people may not like that. So I think it'd be nice if guild, if they sort of had instance dynamic events, if you opt to do that. Where as a guild, you can get a group together and you could join a dynamic event only by yourselves. I think that's a good idea if they kept it, that it was just literally an instance dynamic event. If they turned into a kind of form of raiding, I don't think it would work with the new profession system because, you know, it couldn't work without a holy trinity. You couldn't say this person has to tank and this person has to heal. It wouldn't work. But I like the idea of like a private dynamic event so that you can try and tackle it just as your group and say that, you know, you've completed it for achievement's sake. Well, I have to say that I think one of the best replacements for raiding, if what you're looking for is epic level, organized within a group of people that you know, your guild, let's say, um, content that is difficult. The answer to that, if you, can you think of anything in Guild War II that facilitates that? And the answer is world versus world versus world. It's automatically extremely difficult because you're fighting against other players. And everybody knows that AI can only get you so far. Because usually, I mean, take Civilization series. The, the AI has to cheat in order to be a challenge for any decent player. If in, when you're talking about, wow, you have to have bosses with tens of thousands of X, you know, HP, hundreds of thousands of HP of health, or millions, in order to satisfy the difficulty. And then you have to give them ridiculously overpowered attacks that have to be figured out how to maneuver around. So players 
are going to be the ultimate challenge. A human brain is going to be a lot more unpredictable and interesting to go up against. So you've got very challenging content there. It's going to require a lot of good coordination. At least we hope it will. Taking a keep is not going to be trivial. It's not walk in there and just take it. If there's, other, if there's another guild prepared to defend it, your guild is going to have to fight for it. And so that is going to be something that I could see really replacing it for the people that really enjoy that. If they could get around the fact that it's PvP and not worry about the fact that they're fighting against other players, that is epic level. It is, has a purpose. You know, taking over the keep is like for server pride. It's it's our server is gonna I, be awesome. I disagree. Oh. <laughs> I I think that as at least in going in terms of WoW, there are people who like PvE and there are people that like PvP. There are people that like getting that group together and taking down that massive boss. And there are people that like getting a group together and fighting other people. I don't think that I, I think that World vs. World is going to be challenging, and it's going to be a, a lot of fun, but I don't think that's going to be the replacement for reading. Not for I feel everybody, that, I agree with you. Only for I, some I think, people. I think that dynamic events is going to be the sort of, if people want to get a big epic battle fighting a giant dragon, obviously that's dynamic events. The World vs. World vs. World is just the icing on the cake, and that's just something that is awesome and fun to do. Well, well, if I if I can just say one thing, is that I'm just gonna say it. If you like that raiding, getting a gr having to get a group together, going out there once, twice, maybe three times a week, going into an instance, fighting the bosses, pushing through it. From what we know about Guild Wars 2, if you like doing that, this might not be the game for you. It's true. It's I yes. think. See, I think with raiding, I think a lot of people do it for, you know, coming together and doing something. So whether it's 40 people back from vanilla or you've got 25 people or five people, I think if you want to get a group together, you know who they are, you know their skills and go into a dungeon, I think you still can do that with five people. Um, you know, it doesn't matter that it's not 20. It, you know, you can still defeat the hard challenges. And Arena now have said that, you know, they will be hard. So I think you still kind of have that aspect. It's just on a smaller scale. Yeah, they said it's going to be hard, and they said that they have had problems. That You know, arena net people have been having problems beating specific dungeons. Yeah. Um, the other thing is to point out, if you want to feel a sense of accomplishment, doing a five-man really difficult dungeon, that will give you a massive sense of pride if you manage to succeed because you are 20% of that team. In yeah. WoW, if you're in a 40-man raid, you're just one of the other five mages throwing fireballs at the boss, right? And, and then, you know, calling out, you know, interrupts or whatever. You're, you're one of a giant machine. You can't really take credit for that. Your guild did that. You didn't really do much. You know, I mean, obviously you did play a part and everybody in there needs to play a part, but it does not even compare to being one of five people that did something. It's more you recognition. Really you, yeah, you can say you were in that group. You completed it, and you know whether you were the first person on the server. You know that's something you can be proud of, rather than like you said, a big group of people. Did Did anyone else play Warhammer? Mm -hmm. Besides, bes mm -hmm. I did. I, I mean, the the whole you know Warhammer that was their thing was having the realm versus realm, and it was a lot of fun. But the whole thing is is that as a company you physically it is not possible to balance world versus world or realm versus realm there is there is no way you can go about balancing it so that means if you have a guild let's say we get a guild together we have 40 people and we're going to say all right you know what it's, we're going to go and we're going to go do world versus world and we're going to take that keep but if there's another guild out there that has 100 people doing the same thing all of a sudden now there's nothing you could do. Obviously, they outnumber you. They're going to kill you. So wow. that's, why I f that's why I feel like with the, the World vs. World, it is fun, and it's going to be great ha having raids on keeps, but in terms of that raiding as compared to WoW, mm -hmm. it's, more, it's more structured because you're going into a dynamic event. You know what you're getting into. When you go into a World vs. World, it's completely unbalanced, and it's just whatever happens, happens. Well, uh, the developers 
at ArenaNet, actually, uh, they spoke about that. They want to spawn NPCs on keeps and on raiding guilds proportional to how they're doing against each other. So if you're going up against a guild, if you have a 20-man strong guild going up against a 100-man strong guild, your 20-man guild is going to have NPC support. And they talked about these NPCs not being like joke NPCs that stand around and just shoot off bows and arrows and do nothing. These guys are going to be intricate into your strategy of raiding these keeps, raiding everything. So they're trying to balance the game not through the environment, but through what happens as you're fighting. They're going to be spawning a bunch of stuff on top of you, and it's going to, I think, hopefully do well for the balancing, as long as they can work it out good enough. They yeah. also said, um, if, for example, you're, you, know, you have those people who don't actually like to be in guilds, but like to PvP, and if you and just your in-real-life friends run up to the keep and there's four of you, and you're up against, like you said, 20 people, you also get NPCs. So you don't actually have to be in a guild for that to happen. You can just be a random person saying, hey, I want to take this keep, and you'll get support as well for that, which is cool. There's going to be so much planning into it, too. I mean, if you're, if you're in this guild and let's say you're outmanned, you're outmanned on this keep and you want to kind of even the playing field, you run a small little raid on a lumber mill and you gather up resources that way and they've actually hinted that you'll be able to construct siege weaponry to even the tides of the battle. So if your small little guild is willing to put in the time and the strategy, you can actually place siege weaponry outside this keep that these hundred people are going to have to run out and try and get to you while you just slaughter them with these with these big tre like trebuchets and catapults and all kinds of different things like that. I, I, I completely agree in that the world vs. world is going to be epic and it's going to be a lot of fun and to me, that's what I'm looking for, looking forward to in the end game, is that world versus world. Because it was fun in Warhammer. Warhammer, you know, they they had some screw ups that kind of ruined it. But if if Arena Net could do it right and make it fun, that is going to be a, a great. But the whole thing is, is that I feel like people. The whole thing is is, is the the problem is WoW because WoW has brainwashed people into thinking this is what raiding is, this is what dungeons are, and they need to be open to realizing that there are other games out there that don't have pandas. And be <laughs> I I Let think that there will certainly be what what the professionals like to call a paradigm shift in what people expect out of MMOs, whether Guild Wars 2 is going to do it or maybe Project Titan or whatever, I think that's certainly going to happen. The the reason that raiding exists, the reason that people that you that like uh Testy Testa said um that guilds were invented to keep people playing obviously because of that monthly fee problem. Right? You need to keep people playing because that's how you make your money. And you don't need to do that in Guild Wars 2. So we don't have to worry about mechanics built into the game to keep us playing. So let me ask you guys. Would you be satisfied if you spent, let's say, 100 hours on the PvE content and you leveled one or maybe two characters all the way up, you went through their personal story, you explored everything, you did all the dungeons, you got this epic, you know, final fight against an elder dragon, and then the PvE content ended. You didn't have any more to do for maybe a month or two until the next expansion come out. Would you be okay with that? Or would you be disappointed that the content there wasn't enough content to keep you going all the way through forever? Personally, I feel you know you've got mini games, uh, crafting, and especially with the PvP. Not normally, I don't really play PvP in games, but with the world v world and how they said the battles can last like two weeks, I definitely think I would be fine with waiting for more PvE content because I think they've thought of ways that can you know save us from being bored. Anybody else? Well, I know that they uh, they said that you can do some PV stuff in the World of World, so it's not like you can't do World of World if you don't like if you if you don't want to do PvP. But then, like, if you only want to do PVE in this game, and you just get to the max level, maybe get another character to the max level, and do like the biggest Elder Dragon, the big Zone invasion, or whatever it's going to be, and you get to that point, it's like, well, what do I do now? It's like, well, you can quit and come back because the game's free to play. You can do that. Yep. Anybody else? Uh, uh, oh, go oh, ahead, Jay. Oh, no, you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was just going to say, um, 
I mean, even what we hinted on with rating before, if, uh, if it's replaced by community dynamic events, I feel that one of the major things they're trying to accomplish with this game is a sense of community along with a sense of epicness. So what we were talking about with these dynamic events, they've mentioned that there's going to be a measure of performance as you're playing these events. You're going to get a rating depending on how you contribute to it. So even if you've, even if you've finished, uh, finished the end game and everything like that, if you go back to one of these major fights, let's say even with a guild, you show up with, with 20 or 30 people to this fight, if you start contributing to it and you top out at the top of this performance list, I feel like everybody else who's there wants to get it done. They're going to start listening to you. So I feel like what's more fun in an end game than maybe showing up at this fight that you have experience with, that you and your friends are very good at, and showing it, and kind of when you get there, people listening to you in the sense that they want to get it done, they want to win. And I feel like that's kind of an evolving, never-ending end game, is getting there and maybe telling these people, like, you guys need to go do this, and we'll take care of this part, and you guys do that. Like, we've done it before, you know, like, listen to us, we're going to take it down, like, we want to help you. So maybe the end game won't end in the sense that you're going to contribute to other people finishing their end game. Maybe you're actually going to take the role of this hero at the end who comes back and it's like, listen, I've been here before, I've done it, listen up to us and we're going to get this done. We're going to really take care of this thing. And I mean, what's more epic than that? I mean, then maybe even the sense that you'll be sitting there just doing, doing something in PvE and get messages from people saying, please, like we're having a hard time, come help us here. I right, think Jay. that... Um, I think that... Go ahead. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there's going to be... Sorry. I, okay. So I think the whole reason why people in WoW and these other games need the end game content is because you invest so much time and effort into getting that character up to 80. And I feel like, at least in Guild Wars 1, it wasn't as much of a grind or it wasn't as hard to get to that end point. So when you're there, there's so much to do and you haven't spent you know, months and months and months getting there. So, to me, if I got, if I, because I'm going to make an engineer when, as my first character, if I get an engineer up to 80, I'm going to go right back and do another character, and I'm going to get him up to 80, and I'm still going to have stuff to do between dynamic events and PvP and world versus world. There's yeah. always going to be something to do. And I, I feel like because Guild Wars isn't going to be, it's, I, I'm, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I can only assume that the the time it takes to get from 1 to 80 in Guild Wars 2 is not going to be nearly as long as it is to get to 1 to 80 in WoW. And I feel like it's it's going to be more of like you're playing a role-playing game and it's fun to play that, as opposed to I just want to level up so I could go have fun with my friends who are level 80. And yeah. I think that's that's why the end game, there's just going to be so much to do because even with the whole you know sidekicking system... If I get bored at something at level 80 and, oh, my friend just joined and he's level 10, well, I'm going to go play with him. And I'm going to, I, I enjoy playing with other people and doing things together. And that's why Guild Wars 2 is going to be so great because they're focusing on that, like Brian said, the community and doing things together. I think definitely people are going to find themselves leveling up whilst they're having fun. I don't think you're going to be like, oh my god, I'm only level 10 today. I think you're just going to be having fun, running around, doing dynamic events, and you're just going to level by accident. And I think that's what they want. Just have fun, play with your friends, and you'll just eventually end up at level 80. When you haven't really worked for it, you've just been having fun, especially with the steady leveling curve as well. I, I completely agree. If, if ArenaNet has done their job, then you will not notice that you are leveling, you know, except for the fact that, oh, hey, I just got a new skill or something, or I just got something that I can use. But beyond that, you will not look at your level bar. You will not be, oh, I can't get to this thing yet because it's not available to me. And that sucks, you know, because theoretically, all of the stuff that you will be able to do later, you can also do, you know, once you get past level 10 or 15, you'll be able to have access to everything. You'll have access to PvP at the epic level. You'll have access to, you know, uh, dungeons by the time you're 30. And I assume that since, uh, you know, it's not going to take too long to get to level 30, but you're going to have access to the dungeons. You're going to have access to pretty massive dynamic events and epic level things. And you've got your personal story. And all of that stuff just continues. And it continues to grow in epicness and all of that. So for me, I think it's definitely... Not something that I wouldn't mind. I actually would prefer. I think I, I'm, I'm willing to say I would prefer 
to spend, let's say, 100, 150 hours leveling up more than one character in order to see the different personal stories. If they're, you know, if they're well written, like we we're hoping that they are, they've claimed that, you know, we've got a, we've the secret is that Guild Wars 2 contains a, a regular single player RPG, you know, feeling and, and and story and everything packed within this shell of an MMO. So if it is, you know, anything like half of what they're hyping it up to be, I would love to try out the different personal stories for a couple of the different races. And then if I don't have anything left to do in PVE. I would be happy to walk away from the game for a few months and then get really excited when an expansion comes out. Because one of the things that we all know is that the more you do something, the more you get used to it, and the more that it, it doesn't sustain you, it doesn't make you interested anymore. So taking a break from it before coming back to brand new content would be a boon. It's going to make you enjoy that new content more for having been away. And that's my stance on it. That's yeah, I agree. That, that ties in like what Vega was talking about is that they have to Guild Wars is it's up to Guild Wars to like unbrainwash us out of this trend that we feel like when we play an MMO we need to play it forever. When in reality, in real life, there's times when I want to quit an MMO and play other games that I want to get in real life. Mm -hmm. So Guild Wars Two offers me that option where I don't have to feel like I have to put a bajillion hours in this game to get. I've wasted my monthly money if I go decide to try out Battlefield Three this week or what have you. <laughs> Yeah, Dude, and by I mean, try out, I mean play it for sixty hours a week, which I'm going to start on Tuesday. We might not have a show next week. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We will. I, I mean, Guild Wars. They've already gone against the grain on nearly everything they're doing. You know, it started with the death of the Holy Trinity. Well, actually, no, it started with no subscription. Then it went on to the death of the Holy Trinity, and you know, now this whole leveling curve, and you know, they're, they're trying to make the the game like wow. They make the game so that you never beat it and that so you want to keep on paying for that subscription and they get more money. Guild Wars 2 doesn't have subscription, so they're making a game to make a game so you buy that game and you play the game. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not trying to keep that carrot on the stick out in front of your face. You know, keep getting in there. You know, you're almost there. You're almost there. Yeah. Keep giving, exactly. keep giving us 15 bucks a month. <laughs> you know? and, and what most people don't yep. know is that Diablo 2 was a secret test to figure out exactly what stats boost they need to make to keep people playing. It's like, oh, well, people quit right about here because the next jump in gear isn't high enough. We need to give them a little bigger carrot in order to get them going. Actually, that's not true. They kind of use a lot of that data, though, from Diablo 2. Well, to make guess what game's coming out before their new MMO? <laughs> Diablo yeah. 3 is coming out before their new MMO. So, so you just basically <laughs> said Diablo is a test game for Blizzard to figure out how their MMOs will do and like how far they can push people. Yeah, all right. So we're coming up on the hour. Any final thoughts that you guys have on, uh, on, on Endgame or have we covered it all? I think that's it, definitely. I think one thing that's being said a lot in chat was the uh, flat leveling curve and how quickly it will take to level. And I literally, I think you won't even notice your leveling, especially with, they said it will take, you know, just enough time as it is from level one to two as it will from 79 to 80. So you've not got to spend two days on one level and 10 minutes on a different level. Well, you know, that's true once you get constant. past around level 10 or, or 11, we should come yeah. clarify because level you do out. level really quickly for the first 10 levels or so, and then it plateaus. Yeah. And they said the maximum time is about 90 minutes to go from like 79 to 80. And if you go backwards from there, my estimate is that each level bef uh, preceding level would be one minute less or so. Because that actually, yeah. if you go backwards from 90 minutes, that will bring you right about to where you're supposed to be based on what we've seen happen at level one and, and two and three and four. So that's, that's not bad though. 90 minutes for a level, and that's the longest you'll ever have to do, and it's way at the end of the game. That sounds like a good number to me. Yeah. <laughs> better, than, better than days spent in WoW. Exactly. Yeah, two days <laughs> grinding because you've run yeah. out of quests. You can sit there and be like, I want to get to this level tonight. And now and he's a robot again. It. Now he's a robot oh, again. Here we go. By the way, <laughs> because of the way that your monitor is sitting, and I'll pull it up here so you can see it, you have... The reflection off your glasses that makes it look like one of your eyes is like a robot <laughs> eye, and the other one is a human <laughs> eye. So you're not doing yourself any favors sitting in that particular angle. <laughs> People That's are my still Terminator eye. The Terminator Scan. Eye. Scan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
With that, I think it's time to end the show here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for tuning in. It has been, uh, you've been a fantastic audience. Thanks for everybody in the chat room. We have been watching there. I've been getting some good questions to, uh, to ask in there. And don't forget, talesoftyria.com is the website where you can find us, www.talesoftyria.com. We will be back next week, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good one. So long. See you next week. Bye, everyone.